live now? All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad that you're joining us for Investigations. Bree, I expect that you're here watching us from Arizona. And uh, today we're going we're gonna to move a little faster, I think, and uh, we're going to try to go into the, the science uh, and faith type stuff. And so uh, let's begin uh, with a, a real quick word of prayer, and then we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to net the whole origins thing out for us, and then that'll begin to answer questions, and then we'll get to specifics, okay? So, um, God, we are just our hearts reach out to you, even if we have big questions about whether you're even there. So it just makes sense that if we're going into a place where we're just not sure of things that we would call out. And um, uh, that's what we're doing when we investigate, when we seek, when we ask questions. And uh, reveal yourself, God, to us through the question-asking process. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. So let's look at this whole uh, Genesis Origins thing. So... Um, the issue with the, the science and faith is interesting because it really is an origins question. So I want you to think about this. How many Christians do you know have a problem with the chemical table of elements? Anybody? Anybody? None, right? How many Christians do you know have a problem that believing that um, uh, light takes eight minutes to get here from the sun? Like nobody, right? So... So do Christians have an inherent problem with science? The issue has become a deal because of origins. And why is that? Anyone want to guess? Why has origins become a specific bugaboo with Christianity? And only really in the last 150 years. Anybody? What's the issue going on there? Why would Christians say, yeah, chemical table of elements and run experiments and figure out how the natural world <clears throat> works and botany and biology and let's go for it and then origins. And then all of a sudden, boom. The, the first What's the issue? The first evolution verses of the Bible. Right? So there Seven seems days. to be this obvious contradiction between a literal reading of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And then what else do we know about the major purveyors, the major... Uh, teachers of evolutionary theory, especially the big, you know, sort of um, mouthpieces of it, and their religious perspective. Any connections there that we would draw, that they would draw between or their theory of origins and their religious perspective? Well, let me get it out for you guys. They're atheists. They're atheists. And proudly so, and hang their atheism on their view of origins. Now, if Darwin had come along and said, you know what, this is an amazing thing. The world is an incredibly designed place. There's no design denying that. But it looks like life got here through this gradual process of development and all that kind of stuff. And this apparently is how the great designer, this sort of, you know, sort of unavoidable first cause, a thing that we call God, did it. Then Christians, a lot of Christians would go, huh, <laughs> okay. But no, that's not how it went. And specifically, because Darwin himself, by the way, was uh, uh, agnostic, and, and, and that the theory of origins really turned for him in part on his view of God. So, for example, he had a really huge problem with the natural problem of evil. In other words, cat, cats playing with their food, torturing mice, um, uh, parasites that would lay their eggs inside of a host. And he was, oh, and he just, it, re, it repelled him. He thought there's no way that that's the result of a good designer. And therefore, what underpinned the theory for him was a lack of a designer. And, and, then, and then natural selection became a substitute designer. So that the whole thing, the, all the complexity, all the design, all the beauty and wonder of the natural world could get here without needing any inter intervention. It could get here without needing any mind. So it had a religious, it wasn't just pure, let's figure out how the world works. It had a really strong religious connection all the way from the beginning. And here's what's wild, and most people don't know this. There was a co-discoverer of the theory of evolution. Does anybody know his name? And I don't blame you if nobody does. Someone else discovered the theory of natural selection almost simultaneously with Darwin. It was a guy named Wallace. And can you get his first name for me? Co-discoverer of natural selection. And um, just so we have a first name. So Wallace was not an atheist. Now, he wasn't a Christian either. Fascinating. 
but he was a spiritualist and he believed in design Alfred. and he believed in what's that alfred alfred wallace. Wall, alfred russell wallace he was gonna have and three almost man three years. right yes and that makes him awesome that makes yeah. him an amazing yeah. scholar what now did, has anybody heard of this guy no you haven't but he actually co-discovered actually some people this is a bit conspiratorial but they some people think that darwin co-opted some of his ideas so they both discovered the idea that living species and this is not controversy at all you know how we know it who owns a pet here that's how we know that evolution works because your stupid little pug <laughs> is related to a wolf that's how we know evolution works right but that's we can parse that. We can say that, well, that's microevolution as opposed to macroevolution. We understand that species change. That's what evolution means. Species can change, and they change by selection. It just so happens in the case of dog breeds, they change through artificial selection, not natural selection. So I sit there and I want, hmm, what would I choose in my dog? Smashed face, low intelligence, <laughs> tiny bow legs and can't get up on the bed on their own. And I select for that. And so every dog that's short leg, white haired, smashed face, dumb looking ears. Can you see I've got a bias in this? So I got, I got a bias against the pug, which is a, just a genetic aberration. It's just a, it's just a horrible mutant of a thing. So, so and, it, and it truly is a mutant. It is a mutated wolf. That's what a pug is. A pug is a mutated wolf. Yeah, right? Oh, that's right. I forgot this is going out to the internet. Oh, pug, pug owners, I'm so sorry. Well, I don't know. He says that Cooper twice smart. He rings the bell. Nice. Well, we know that poodles are very smart. I had an Alaskan Malamute. The Alaskan Malamute is the closest to a wolf. And everybody thought he was a wolf. He was huge. He was 130 pounds. And super smart. So, anyhow, uh, all this to say that that's evolution right that's evolution and all that darwin did was extrapolated that process where you can select for certain traits and they get uh the fancy word is instantiated what's the simple word they get infused into a species by selection if you keep selecting for a certain feature then suddenly everything now has it and then the old feature's gone now the species has evolved so does that have to that whole, that process it just that process does that have to mean atheism? It doesn't. But if you extrapolate it and say, if that's the way you can make eyes and livers and kidneys mm -hmm. and dogs in the first place, and you don't need any intervention, any design, any information, then now you've got a religious perspective and you've kind of infused it. And the question, the open question, is whether Darwin's theory has the explanatory power to, to explain the appearance of incredibly complex features and not just smashed faces, bow legs, skin colors, and the, and the, and the features that we know we can uh, see species evolving. Okay, so if, now I've set the table. There's a religious implication of origins. And so let's focus the science question right down to origins because that's what it's about. Um, you know, and, and, um, and we'll back up and talk about Christian scientists in just a second. All right. So just to net out the, the big picture here for everyone, there's three main ways that Christianity looks at the origins question. And there's a fourth perspective that's not Christian. So there's young earth creationism. We'll call it YEC from here on out. And then there's old earth creationism. And then there's. Evolu uh, they, it's a theistic evolution. They now have a new name for themselves. They like to call themselves um, evolutionary creationists. Evolutionary, I think that's so. Evolutionary creationism. Okay? So, young earth creationism believes in, a, uh, and the, most of this hangs on their interpretation of Genesis, in a 10,000-year-old earth. And that all there's no death on the earth before Adam and Eve sin, and um, and that uh, you know everything was created in a state of um, you know equilibrium perfection. And so some of the key uh, people here is a guy named Ken Ham, and the granddaddy of young earth creationism was a guy named Henry Morris. Okay, so I'm just giving you. Uh, 
so these are all serious Christians. Now, um, we'll talk about this in a second. Theistic evolution basically accepts <laughs> Darwin's theory and just says this can be reconciled with, with Christianity and specifically the book of, of Genesis. And so it believes in basically Darwinism and it, um, you know, so, you know, ain't uh, uh, old earth, uh, deep time, and, um, and that God was sort of hidden in the process of natural selection. I you know, would say God hidden. And some of the main purveyors of this, C.S. Lewis had really no problem with the theory of evolution, although he, he wrote against it. Uh, so he had no issue accepting that things change over time biologically, um, that, um, that the universe was old, and that um, it could all be reconciled with Genesis. So C.S. Lewis was there, but he had he did have huge problems with with Darwinism as a as a religious perspective. In other words, as a as an escape hatch from design, he had a he had a problem with that. The guy who's most notable today is a guy named Francis Collins. He's been big in the COVID thing, so maybe your views of him might have dimmed in the last couple of years. But he is an evangelical Christian, takes the Bible very seriously, and believes heartily that Darwinism can be reconciled with the book of Genesis. Yes? Does this differ from Clockwinder theory, or is this essentially Clockwinder No, nope, it's here. Oh, okay. Clock, are you talking about Schrader? Well, Ger Gerald Schrader? Just everything was put in motion by God, and then he walked away. Oh, yeah. That's, no, that, now, that's, probably, that's probably here. That's deism? Yeah. Yeah. If God's not involved, if God is... It's, he started it all off and then just like, yeah, yeah, but 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 yeah, but absolutely yeah. hidden and and the entire thing is now running <laughs> by natural law, and the natural laws that we observe today can explain everything. That's here, okay. Then old earth creationism accepts that the earth is old. They believe in deep time. They do not believe in a, a literal um, a literal view of days. So non-literal view of the days of Genesis. Can you define deep time, right? Deep time just means old Earth. So the, the accepted age of the universe is 13.7 billion years old. And that's a big no-no here. Uh-uh. Okay. And then both these guys and these guys just accept that, no problem. Like the, the age of the Earth. Age of the Earth is four and a half billion years old. That's what was accepted in the Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's for the, for the universe, yeah. four for the Earth. Yeah. Four billion. For the earth. Yeah. I think we're up to 15 and 6 now. But Actually, it's gone down. Has it gone down? Yeah. It, it was started at 15 when they, when they Hubble and that, that crew. Uh, but yeah, okay. So they believe in deep time, non literal view of the days of Genesis. And um, they, they don't really have a, a theological problem with Darwinism. They have a pretty big scientific problem with it. And a lot of views come in here. So there's a day-age idea. People come here. In other words, every day of Genesis equals an age. Gerald Schrader, who Dwayne really loves this. It's a harmonization between the, uh, the days of Genesis and the theory of relativity. And I'll tell you that, I mean, she, uh, Dwayne has a, a great link that I keep sharing around because it's really a pretty cool harmonization. Using the fact that time bends... We now know that time is relative. We know that because of Einstein. And that if you take time, uh, if you can imagine the universe exploding into existence 13.7 billion years ago, from the perspective of Earth, given the dilation of time, that actually seven 24-hour days is exactly how much time you'd have, from a certain perspective, to get us from zero to 13.7 billion years today. You say, how does that work? I don't know. This, uh, <laughs> but here, but here's, what I, here's what I know, and here's what we all can know, right? That we now know that time is relative. In other words, if you got a spaceship... We all watched in our stellar. Exactly. Yeah. You know that time is relative, and that's a, that's a fact. So time is not an absolute inside the universe. If you go a million miles an hour in this direction and come back a million miles, everybody on Earth will have aged a very long time, and you would not have aged at all, right? We know that. So time is relative to the speed that you're going. So... Given that Einsteinian idea, that's where this harmonization comes in. So Schrader lives here. Day age people live here. Uh, intelligent design lives here. Okay, that all lives here in this third middle way. 
some of the main uh, people here that you'll maybe you'll recognize some of these this is the granddaddy of intelligent design, this guy named Philip Johnston, and um, um, William Dembski. I'm kind of a huge fanboy of these guys, so I know a lot of names you've never heard. Dembski. And you can look these guys up, and I have a bunch of their books on my shelf. Um, okay, so we've netted it out. All three camps have serious Christians in them. And when I say serious Christians, I define that as people who hold orthodox beliefs. In other words, they, they, they fit in line with what all Christians at all times and all places have believed, and they take the Bible seriously. All the people that I've mentioned here, these, all these people would agree. And this now, would be the secondary issue. And they would all consider this a secondary issue. Right? Like not the most important thing in Christianity. The most important thing in Christianity is Jesus and what you think about him. Now, you, there is no view here. There's none, none of, no one of these views has, no, there's no free lunch. Any view that you accept here, you're going to cost. And let me tell you what it is. The cost here is you're going to struggle with dealing with the appearance of age. Okay? Because the universe appears old. Now, there are some things that young earth creationists use to, to argue that the universe actually appears young. But they really struggle because you've got you've got time that time the time that that the light is taking to, to you just look out of the night sky and you're looking at an old a very old universe. So so you, so you have to accept that as an appearance. And when we say appearance, we say not really old. It just appears old. Okay, <laughs> all right. So you have to you have to deal with the appearance of age, and you just call it well. It's just it appears old. It's not really old. These people over here have to deal with the appearance of design. It, it, you have to say that it appears design. And there's a real issue with that because, I mean, if you believe in Darwinism, there's no design, right? Darwinism, by definition, does not accept design. Design requires intelligence, forethought, planning, and top-down function, which everything has, by the way. So, so when you look in biology, you have all those things. You have top-down function. You have pyramidal function. Think about your body, right? You, you have literally thousands of functions going on in your body right now, all the way down to one, every one of your five trillion cells, which has no idea what your body's doing. But it is, it is the cells in your leg are making a leg. And your legs, two legs together, move this body along. And everything is like a pyramidal thing that feeds the top function of the organism. But all the bottom things, all the heart's doing is just doing this. Boom, boom. That's its function. And what's it doing? Well, it's there as part of a pyramidal structure that serves a, well, you don't get that without planning. Well, Darwinism says you can't. So it's just everything has to be utterly incremental. It has to be. It has to be piecemeal, and it has to be accidental. It's utterly critical that it's an accident. That's actually by definition. Okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so the digestive system, just all by itself, is unbelievably complex. It is. And it is, its main function is to break down the food we eat and turn it into energy for our skeletal system. Yes. So Darwin's suggesting that the digestive system, which doesn't exist to serve itself, sprung into uh, fully functioning form at the exact precise time that the skeletal and muscles, muscular systems did. No, that's not that's not a fair way to look at Darwin. Okay. What Darwin would say is that every complex feature <clears throat> comes about through a the series, an almost infinite series, of successive slight modification. Like the fish Which, crawling what? out of the water and growing. Exactly. So the, the, the digestive system does not appear out of nowhere. I mean, I know that's not what you're really thinking, but it doesn't, it doesn't come in fully formed. By the theory, it can't. The theory requires that it has to come through a series of accidental 
modifications. And the only reason that those modifications are preserved is because they give a, a survival advantage. So the digestive system starts as something accidentally simple, like a single cell organism taking in sugars from its, its existing environment and pooping them out. And when I say poop, I mean just excreting out of the membrane, okay? That's how it starts. And then that gets more complicated, more complicated, more complicated, until we get a small intestine, large intestine, and the whole thing. So, so I, yeah, this, my, my point is that the system doesn't serve itself. No, it doesn't. And so there, there are issues. I'm, I'm just saying, let's, okay. I just want to frame it in the most fair way possible. So um, this is a, I'm butchering the quote, but this is almost a direct quote. If it could be proved, I'm Darwin now. If it could be proved that any feature of biology that could not have come about through a series of slight successive modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. That's almost a direct quote. That's pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I've read these books so much now. It's like, so that's what Darwin said. And he had a real issue with the eye. He knew that the eye was a massive challenge to his theory. Uh, he knew that two things, two, two things were a massive challenge to his theory. Design and just overall design, things that, uh, that appear to defy successive modification, things that, things that were irreducibly complex, in other words. Like you could imagine a simpler eye, but once you like fall off, well, once you take out a certain set of features of the eye, it ceases to be an eye. Uh, and the, the word for that is irreducibly complex. You can't, you can't reduce it past a certain amount of complexity. And if you can't, then there's no successive accidental way that that thing can become, that it can, it can be made. Does that make sense? So he knew that the, the eye presented a massive challenge to him or other things like the eye, things that were too complex to have come about accidentally. But it his theory required it to be accidental. As soon as you believe, like Christians do, these are theistic evolutionists, keep in mind. They're not, see, I said there was a fourth. The fourth category is atheistic evolutionists, okay? And, and you, you have to believe that God is somehow guiding the process. But because you're a Darwinian, you can't see God in the process. So the irony for these people is that they have to accept that design is only apparent. It's not real. <clears throat> design isn't real. It's just, just like for these guys, age is just an appearance. It's like, hmm, it, it's, that's the way it appears, but it's not really old. It appears designed, but it's not really designed. Does this make sense? Okay, well, there's no free lunch for anybody, and so there's no free lunch for these people either, because they have to deal with the appearance of evil. And what do I mean by that? The, the appearance of natural evil. When you look at the long ages, if you accept the long ages of the earth, which they do, if you look at the long ages of carnivorism, death, disease, mayhem on the earth, you have a massive issue of natural evil. So you either have to say, you have to say that, that it only appears evil. It's not really evil. It's not really bad. It's not really m malformed. Am I making sense? When the lion attacks the gazelle. It's good. It's, it's, it looks ugly to you, and it's like, it makes you cringe, but it's good. It appears evil. It's not really evil. Make sense? The so these, what's that? The lion's got to eat. It can't go to the grocery Okay, store. so you're with these people. So you're saying it, it, it isn't I'm, evil, and that's what they do. They make that error. They make the argument yeah. that our arguments against natural evil, a lot of it are based on sort of human anthropomorphizing of the natural world. And if we didn't anthropomorphize the lion and the gazelle, yeah. we would just say there's there's actually beauty here and there's design and nothing is wasted and it's cyclical and it's Lion King. Yeah. Anyone knows the Lion King, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, Dad, don't we eat the gazelle? Yes, but when we die, we become the grass and the gazelle eat the grass. And so we're all connected in the great circle of life. So that's where these people would live. That it's not really evil. It looks evil to us. It looks evil. It's not really evil, but okay. And I, I say that, that that maybe is an obstacle you can get around, but it's an obstacle. It's an issue. You've got to reconcile it because the Bible is clear about one thing from Genesis. Well, about many things. But one thing is creation is, yeah, good. The word is good. And actually, maybe that's really critical that we don't use that word because good 
doesn't have to mean perfect. And these people would insist on that. Good doesn't mean complete. Good doesn't mean perfect. Good doesn't mean uh, without death. Yeah. But with a lack of perfect <clears throat> lead to mistakes from a God who should not be able to make mistakes? Well, the, that's the question. The question is, is, what's a mistake. what's that? I said, who gets to determine what's a mistake? Yeah, I think that would be, yeah. that's my answer. So is is a an ecosystem that is utterly self-sustaining and built on code that is three billion letters long and microscopic and you can't see it with the naked eye and will perpetuate itself into infinity with almost no mistakes in the copying process uh, and actually has error detection codes and it's like a computer. I mean, James can appreciate this. How does your computer send information to my computer? I make it. <laughs> but, but then when it, when it shows up, it doesn't have to decode it and stuff. Like it actually, you shoot out a packet of information. And yeah. So explain to the dumb networks. people. How, so, how? Network, so networks basically are a programmatical way of copying human communication. They, they essentially are coded so that two computers that want to talk to each other they, they go, hey, hey, right. what's up? I'm going to send you information. Okay, what are we going to talk about? And then they exchange. Right. They uh, agree on window sizes. So they like, okay, I'm going to talk to you in five paragraphs at a time. Is that okay right. five paragraphs? Oh, just three? Two. Okay, two paragraphs at a time. And then they agree, and then da -da 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 -da, they exchange information. Then there's a protocol that says, okay, we're going to end our communication now. That happens. See, I mean, yeah, it's all it, it all it requires an enormous amount of code in order to make it make it all. That work. can happen really fast. Oh yeah, all this happens <laughs> speed of Milli milliseconds, speed of light, basically. Yeah. Now, but what's so critical about this is that is exactly how DNA works. And and you needed that not just as a as an accidental byproduct of millions of years of evolution. You needed that right at the beginning, like from the first life, which is why the origin of life is such a huge issue here. So or there are massive um, um, moments where we need infusion. So the Big Bang, let's start there. We need a massive amount of, of um, design and parameters and laws so that we have a universe. If we don't have the exact set that we have, and Penrose worked this out, along with who's the guy from the wheelchair and the... With Hawking. Hawking and Penrose worked this out. The, the chances of us having a universe with laws and the size that we have and the, and all the parameters that it has was like one, and it's called the universal constant, and it is an utterly breathtakingly fine-tuned number. The, 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 the laws of the universe that sprung into existence at the moment of the Big Bang um, uh, are, are so finely tuned. I don't even have the number of that, then, but I have the number for gravity. It's some ridiculous, you know a ridiculously finely tuned number. Uh, one in like, like imagine 10 to the kajillion. Okay, so the Big Bang, you have to have the, you have to have an infusion of information at the origin of life. <clears throat> you have to have some, uh, a huge information at the origin of complex life. You have to have an inf infusion of information at the origin of consciousness. Uh, by the way, for those who want to look it up later, the official name of the argument for fine tuning is called the teleological argument. The teleological argument, which comes from the Greek word telos, which just means end or goal. So, so you basically, so Darwinism does not accept anything like this. They don't accept the Big Bang. I mean, because most Darwinists now are are uh, multi-universe people. That's, that's what I was going to ask you. So if, if there is a specific design that's one that's off, is that considered a code or multi-universe, parallel universes and all that? How does that fit into it? Or the what, theory of What happens is the multiverse becomes a an escape hatch from the Big Bang. So here's what's wild, right? If you know of any young Earth creationists in your life, and there may be some in this room, and we don't want to disrespect you, but you, um, you have a problem with the Big Bang theory. And because it smacks to you of atheism, because it smacks of evolution. But here's what you may not know if you're a younger creationist. When the people who 
stumbled into the fact that the universe is expanding and because it's expanding if you just kind of work that clock backwards if that means that the universe has come out of a finite point of infinitely high density and infinitely small space at some point in the distant past the finite past what everyone started realizing was <laughs> what does this sound like hmm, something coming from nothing Something, design, uh, uh, incredible complexity, size, space. What's that sound like? That starts to sound like Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And everybody who wasn't a Christian picked it up. And you know why they picked it up? Because, well, it just it was obvious. There was unbelievable theistically friendly implications to the Big Bang Theory. So, you know, you got some young earth creationists, and he's, he's sporting a T-shirt that says, I believe in the Big Bang. God spoke and bang, it was, or something like that. And they're just they're they're trying to downplay this because they think it's all connected to the to the atheism, the atheistic implications of Darwinism. But it's not. If you know anything about the development of the Big Bang theory, you know that an unbelievably friendly theistic implications. You know how we know that? When Einstein got together with Hummel and um, who was that other cat? And he was a um, he was actually a priest scientist priest and he got together with these guys and his own his own mathematical calculations were basically working out this idea that the universe was moving that it was expanding okay so his 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 research was leading him to believe that he thought wait a minute and he knew right away if the universe is expanding it's not eternal and a non-eternal universe is a real problem for atheism because atheism kind of rests on the idea that stuff is eternal, and only stuff is eternal. Given enough time, anything can happen. And anything, and just, <coughs> yep, give enough time, anything can happen to stuff, which itself is probably spurious thinking, but that's the way we thought it. Given enough time, anything can happen with stuff, and just give, but stuff doesn't have an eternity of time. It's only got a finite amount of time, and he... He refused to believe that that could possibly be true because he knew how profound were the theistic implications. And so what did Einstein do? He actually changed his own theory. He fudged his own numbers. <clears throat> and so what Einstein did was he put in uh, the fudge factor. I can't remember what he called it. It was a special name. But he actually changed it, uh, his famous theorem about relativity and all that kind of stuff. He changed it so that it would match a steady state universe. And then when he got together with these other guys, Hubble and Pen, not Penrose, uh, the cosmological constant or lambda is what the fudge factor was. Okay. Yeah. So he so he called it the cosmological constant. He just uh, jammed it into the theory, and just he, he, out of whole cloth, just to make it work, so that the universe could be steady state. So he gets together with Hubble. Hubble shows him what's going on with the telescope, and he you know he, the um, the priest Georges. It calls him a reference, but yeah. Yeah, Lamatra. Yep, Lamatra. Yes. So Lamatra, Hubble, and Einstein are getting together, and then Hubble uh, and Einstein can't get around. It's like the universe is expanding. And why and why does he think that? Because Hubble shows him the redshift. The redshift is like the Doppler effect. Um, and not to make this too complicated, but basically it showed that, that the redshift on stars was greater for stars that were farther away from you than stars that were closer, which meant that the stars are farther away were moving away faster than the ones that were closer to you, which implied this, this idea that the universe is stretching out like a garment. And Einstein couldn't get away from it, and he called the fudge factor the greatest mistake of my life. He retracted it, and he, he went all in on this. And it didn't mean that he became a Christian. No one became a Christian on this. Lamantra already was one. But the point was that this was unbelievably friendly to to theist, to a theistic worldview, and and scientists wanted to avoid it, and they still want to avoid it. So they tried the steady state theory, which was basically yes, we accept that the universe maybe is expanding, but maybe it's oscillating, so it goes out, it it collapses, it goes out, it collapses over infinite time. There was about four or five different models that were presented to get away from this, and why? It wasn't because the evidence was so strong, like, yeah, we can't believe in a Big Bang Theory. It was because a universe that begins at a, at a finite point in the past is a universe that began. And a universe that begins requires a Later. beginner. It requires a beginner, and everybody knew it. So 
having proved the Big Bang is basically the best model for the universe's beginning and origins, how can you get around the theistic implications? This, the multiverse. So you accept everything. You say, yep, the universe started in the, in the, in the finite past. It has, a, it has a definitive age. That means it's very, very old, but that still means that it started. It had a beginning, but maybe it's just one of a suite of millions of these universes that then explains why there's so much design. So this teleological argument that Wayne, uh, James is talking about is basically saying, I mean, I'm, my goodness, if, if everything was so finely tuned here, I mean, how do you get that how, by accident? Well, here's how, is what if you have a gajillion universes? And they're all different. They're just popping up like bubbles on a, on your on your bathroom soap phone, there's going. Boop, 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 boop. There's just like bubbles, and all these universes, and they're all different. They start, and they all have different properties. They have a different property for the for the cosmological constant. They have a different value for the for the uh, for the force of gravity. They have a different atomic force, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force. All these values are different in the different universes. Well, guess what? Then it's like going down to Vegas. What are your chances of winning a million dollars when you go to Vegas? What are your chances? Just give me some odds here, people. Super low. Very, very low. <laughs> but what if you went to Vegas a million times? Do your odds go up or down? They go up. So this is why the multiverse is very appealing. It's because this finely tuned universe is utterly <clears throat> devastating to an atheistic perspective. So how do you get out of that if you don't want to deal with the theistic implications of it. Well, just imagine that you're going to Vegas. You're going to the Universal Vegas, and you're hitting that slot machine time and time, literally infinite amount of times, and guess what? You're going to get a cool universe. So, so not we won the million bucks. Right yes, yes, we won the Universal Lottery. Lee, go ahead. So, again. <laughs> so not only do we need to get the right universe, but you got to get the right evolution in the right universe. You absolutely do because so, so it makes it even that which is, much. Which is yes, earth. because basically all the, here's what evolution galaxy. says. Evolution is just that it is inevitable that given this suite of natural laws that there will eventually be uh, yeah, not just life, but an upright Homo well, sapiens that has a big brain like you. Well. What it's dealing with time as well. What evolution is dealing with that same. Yes, yes, and if evolution can't get the job done. In 13 billion, billion years, which ironically you think that's way too much time for anything. Actually, there's huge time problems for Darwin, Darwinism. Huge time problems. For example, the transition from a mouse to a whale <laughs> is, is less than 10 million years. Less than 10 million years. You say, well, that's a lot of time. Don't. They, okay, think about the morphological changes required. that you that are required to turn a mouse into a into a blue whale. You have to move the nostrils from here to here. You have to change the teeth from these things to baleen. You have to change the reproductive organs. They from hanging outside the body, they gotta be up inside the body. Uh, and there's all sorts of interesting design features about that, which I won't get into. You gotta you, breathe you, you did air. make a commitment. I did make a commitment not to, get, <laughs> not to talk about whale testicles. I promise you, I will not talk about whale testicles. But this is the point: is that to turn a mouse into a whale, you have a massive time problem. Massive time problem. It's too little time for too much evolution. Okay, someone has their hand up. Yeah, sorry. Um, Everyone that I've talked to that brings up the multiverse as a way, uh, as the escape hatch, um, seem to abandon science when they start talking about it. Like, you, you start talking about science, yes. and they'll agree with you that, uh, the, that science is all about we observe, we test, we hypothesize, we validate, and then we verify or we try again. And that's just kind of how yeah. we just discover how things work. But no one has ever been outside this universe or observed another one. So how are we supposed to evaluate rightly whether or not other multi other universes exist? Yeah, and how is that good science? Right. It's metaphysics at that point. We've left the realm of science at that point. Now, 
The best thing you can say about the multiverse is that it is theoretically possible based on the math inside this universe. But like what you're saying is there's no observation of that. And there never will be. It's impossible. Like yeah. by definition, there's no way to observe MIT the just did a paper on this like two months ago. Who? MIT. Okay. And the math, they're using dark matter. The existence of dark matter is proof of the multiverse. Okay. It's because it's the opposite. Yeah. Of it, right? Yeah. So, and here's the other thing about the multiverse. So let's assume the multiverse because the math says that it's possible. But um, the guy who has really kind of wrote the book in some sense on the expanding universe, a guy named Alexander Vilenkin, a very, very smart Russian um, astrophysicist, has said any universe, even a suite of universes that is expanding, has got to have a finite point in time. And... So when you uh, so again, this is way over my head, but what I can simply I can you know, translate it for us simply here tonight, I can say that what he says is that the multiverse requires a multiver it requires a universe generating machine. The what what makes universes in the first place? What is this thing that what's doing that? That that itself is finely tuned. So whatever that is is finely tuned and it needs an explanation. So you can't get away from it. You can't get away from it, exactly. The multi even the multiverse, it's an escape hatch from the design, from the finely tuned nature of our universe, but yes, it turns out it needs its own explanation. In other words, the multiverse is finely tuned. <laughs> <laughs> if, if such a thing exists, Sarah. So the problem with the appearance of the design is that you would have to have a designer and they're trying to go every other way around that trying to but they keep landing on something has to start somewhere like yes exactly well especially when it talk when you talk about the universe there's a there's the scientific argument which is it looks like the universe began from relativity and all that stuff but then there's also a philosophical argument and the philosophical argument goes like this if you have a series of dominoes is it possible to have the to be watching the dominoes fall right now, you go, oh, look, that one's touching that one, which is moving that one, which is moving that one. Is it possible to have the dominoes falling and have them not have started somewhere? In other words, could it have gone back infinitely? And the philosophers, you know, that'll bake your noodle. <laughs> so, and and there's a school of thought I agree with is that there is no such thing as, here's what fancy word for it, there is no such thing as an infinite regress of causes. Each domino is a cause, right? Cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect. Now, can you chase that back infinitely? And philosophers will say, philosophically, whether it's true or not in, the, in space, it's philosophically impossible. Yeah. I was just, my, I'm trying to cut, it's a lot. Yeah. Right. No, I know it is, right? So basically, the difference in opinion is some certain people believe that it's a coincidence. The other side is there was a cause. Yeah. And those who believe it was a coincidence, the domino, yeah. like example, they just believe that it never, no one ever pushed the first person. Exactly. Okay. It's an infinite. It goes, it never, there is no beginning. There is no beginning. And the multiverse is there's no beginning to that. Yeah. Christian. You're allowed to just tell me no if it's yes. no Alex, yeah. um, for what we're getting into today. But you say that <clears throat> with the idea of the Big Bang and the, the multiverse there is who there has to be something there to create that. But what is created like what where this would have to do with where God came from. Yes. If there's a creation, yes. there has to be a creation of the thing to create the thing. Yes. Right. No, see, and that, there doesn't. And that, that's the argument for God. So the argument for God is that existence itself requires something that isn't, doesn't hang on something else. So for the domino chain to get started, we need something outside of the chain. It requires it. So in, the, in some sense, what the Christian would say is that existence itself requires an unmoved mover. The one who can move but is himself not moved. God, God doesn't have time. He created time. Right. So, you know, the Christian view is that, you know. Right, yeah. You're right. <laughs> That's it. Mine is now. Well, just imagine, okay, imagine like this. 
here's the universe. Everything that we know, time, space, matter, which is energy, God exists outside of all is, is inside the circle, right? It's inside the circle. And the idea is that God exists outside. So your question presumes a God who lives inside the circle. Okay. And what Christians believe is that God lives outside the circle. So outside was, of time, outside of space, outside of matter, outside of energy. He never wasn't. Exactly. And when he shows up to Moses, does anyone want to guess what he reveals his name as to the human race? I am. I am. And isn't that profound? He revealed that to Moses 3,000 years ago. 3,000, now 3,500, 3,500 years ago. And, and we would eventually come to this place where, you know, big bang, oh my gosh, the universe is a gigantic place, and yet it had a beginning, and it's finite, and then God says, I am. I exist. All this stuff depends on everything else. Time is relative, space is finite, matter is finite, energy is huge, but it's finite, and here's God. He stands outside of this. Now, by the way, because we know that the Big Bang is the best way of looking at the universe. We know that it came, all these things came into existence at a certain point of time and that something caused them to come into existence. That thing, whatever it is, had to be timeless. What's the word, another word for that? Infinite. Infinite. Spaceless. What's another word for that? We could say this is eternal. Uh, omnipresent, like in other words, could be anywhere because space is not a limiting factor for this thing, whatever it is, and matter. Uh, utterly manipulate, can manipulate anything. Omnipresent. Omnipresent. Omnipresent would have to do with space. Omnipresent. Energy and matter would have to do with power, right? Power to, over stuff. Omnipotent. Now, look at this. This is an interesting definition of the thing that started it all. Eternal, omnipresent, and omnipotent. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like God. Somebody had questions about the uh, attributes of God and where those things are located in the Bible. What's interesting is that Rick just pointed out you need to crack open a Bible and you're looking at a description of God of himself in Scripture. Pretty cool. So here's the three ways that Christians will look at the origins question. There are serious Christians in all three camps. They all have a problem. They have, to, they have to get through something. They have to get through something. Wait, and so they should... this point, yeah. when those were all recorded in the Bible, nobody understood. Yeah. Nobody knew any of that. No. When the Bible said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, every other culture believed that the gods were part of the created order. So when the Jews come along and said, God stands outside this, they, were, they, were, they would have been a laughing stock. Dwayne? Well, in that when uh, people like to hang their hat on uh, the, well, who created God, right? Yeah, that's but, Christian's question. But time can began at the Big Bang, and atheistic scientists acknowledge that that was the beginning of time. Yeah. So for him to have existed all time, for all time, he just had to be present during the Big Bang. Right, and again, it gets to his name, right? I am. It's just yeah. the eternally existing one. So existence isn't like tick, 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 seconds ticking by on a clock. That's not the picture, right? God is not old, and God is not young. He exists. He exists. Yeah. I remember you explaining it one time as like a house, and the person that built the house doesn't live by the same rules of the structure of the house or something? Yeah. Like, but well, he like can a walk into the house. Right, like a playwright. He writes, he's written the play, we're acting in the play, but he can, and he can write himself into the play if he wants to, and yeah, he's not bound by the same rules. And I think it was C.S. Lewis that had the ar the architect and the designer yeah. of the house can live yeah. outside the house, and you don't, that's, you can find him inside the house, but that doesn't mean the house is the designer. Right. That's good. All right, so let's look at these questions, and then let's knock them out. Uh, how does evolution match up with the creation story of Genesis? If you're a theistic evolutionist like Francis Collins, you think just beautifully. 
And by the way, they do have something going for them. It's interesting, when you look at the days of Genesis, they go from simple to complex. And that's the rough story of evolution. And now, yes, I mean, if you go specifically, you've got the separation of the waters, you have the plant animals, then you have the, then you have the nephesh animals, which are, by the way, the, the animals created with, with soul uh, on, on the sixth day. But that roughly follows an evolutionary sort of thinking of simple to complex. So they would have no problem with that. Uh, but like I said, they've got to deal with design. And if you're going to be a pure Darwinian, you basically have to say that God is hidden in the process. You actually can't detect him. And so there's a lot of Christians that don't want to even think about how God is in, in, the, in the evolutionary process because you can't detect it because it's purely working by natural law. And that's it. There's no infusion of information. There's no infusion. There's no big bang of, of the universe. There's no big bang of life. There's no big bang at the Cambrian explosion. And there's no big bang of the mind. But actually, if you look back, I think the evidence shows all these are big bangs. And maybe you've heard of that. You've heard of, have you ever heard of the big bang of the mind? The mind's big bang? Just Google it. And it's really weird how we just sort of sprung up like architecture, religion, language. Language is probably the most important thing, just in a fit about 10,000 years ago. All right, so um, anyway. so there, there's a lot of Christians who feel like it can fit. How does a young Earth creation timeline of Genesis fit with a timeline of development of Homo erectus to Homo sapiens? It doesn't. There's no fitting. And by the way, so if you're if you're young Earth creationist, you have to reject because you have to reject appearance of age and you have to reject appearance of change. So... Now, what's interesting is people, Christians in this camp and in this camp, have just wildly different views of, of how we get Adam into a picture of human development. So right now, the best book I'm reading on this is, and I haven't really dove into it past the introduction, um, is William Lane Craig's The Historical Adam. And he basically, his theory is that he, he's in this camp. He's kind of somewhere between this camp and this camp. Um, and his theory is that, first of all, Homo erectus, and he would say Neanderthal, they're all humans. They're all humans because they have the stamp of the image of God. And the stamp is defined as those sweet, that suite of characteristics that are uniquely human, and generally it relates to language. So our ability for abstract thought, where we get, we get code for things, and that allows us to uh, push ideas forward to remember things to record things for me to build on your ideas and you made a wheel well, I'm gonna make a cart and now we're, and now all of a sudden boom human humanity is off and running when we can think abstractly well Homo erectus made tools there was uh, 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 Neanderthal I've got Neanderthal DNA apparently uh, I did 23 and me so Neanderthal is clearly human because human Homo sapiens and Neanderthal interbred so in the same way that mules and horses are, um, are that related, that they can interbreed uh, Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. Were. So, so if my wife calls me a Neanderthal, it's kind of a compliment. <laughs> it's kind of a <laughs> Neanderthals had bigger brains. Just saying. They really I did. I they had bigger that. brains and rickets. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the question is just how, is, how does it fit? In the younger three creations don't try to fit it. They would just look at anything that's not Homo sapiens, uh, Adamic man made in the image of God. They would just say as the, you say, what about the fossil record of those They would just look at those as uh, extinct apes, extinct primates. And there's a variety of views here, guys. Just a variety of views. Even if they could be dated older than 10,000 years? Well, then, no. See, they just would deny the date. Because okay. remember, that's just an appearance. It would be like Adam shows up with a navel. He's one day old, but he's got a navel as if he was born in a womb. A tree has a million rings, but it was, it was literally, boom, like, zapped from heaven onto earth in the young earth view. And so the rings would look like you cut that tree and you'd go, oh, look, it's 500 years old. But the younger creatures say that appears old. It is not old. Yeah. Okay. So that's their view. It just looks that way. It, exactly. Really. And it's just like same thing here. It just looks designed. It's actually an accident. But it looks designed. And same, same thing here. Well, it looks evil, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, there were questions about um, biblical interpretation. And if you are looking to land on one of these three, like to help, one of the things that we do in hermeneutics is called uh, letting the Bible interpret the Bible. 
Remember how Rick was talking about the three most important words in Bible study? Context, context, and context. Okay, so one of the things that you need to do in scripture study for reconciling whether uh, a day in the creation account in Genesis 1 is a 24-hour solar day or whether it can be any other length of time is you look at the original language context and determine, okay, the word for day in Hebrew is this word. Where does this word show up everywhere else? And everywhere else it shows up in, in the Hebrew text or in the, or in the uh, Septuagint, whatever. Is it always a 24-hour day? If it's not, you're not required to interpret a 24-hour day. The other thing you do is you look at um, whether or not, like what, what the text would have meant to its original author or hearers. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, so everything before this, so we, we've got the creations of light, we've got um, you know, the, the expanse and all this other stuff. We get to verse 11, and it says, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit, trees bearing fruit, in which is, and, and their seed each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. Now, everybody listening to this was agricultural. There isn't anybody in the audience that would have heard God say, um, let the earth bring forth and thought, oh, it just showed up. Bam. They would have immediately gone, oh, that means it just grew naturally over time. Unlike with light, where God said, let there be light, this would let the earth spring forth. And that implies we aren't required to interpret a 24-hour day for that. And you can see how a create, create a, what are they called? Evolutionary creationists, evolutionary creationism could drive a Mack truck into that verse. Let the earth bring forth. Well, it's the earth that's doing it. So there's some sense in which it seems like the earth has been endowed with power through its natural laws to bring forth. Except things. God said it. That's <laughs> right. And that's where, where old earth creationists would yeah. say there must be an infusion of, and that's what that's what it would say is being communicated in the, and God said, and God said, and God said. So there's a day and then things are playing out according to natural law, and then God infuses new information at each one of these epochs, each day. And God said, and now there's a new, and sometimes just go with me, it's a, it's a new Big Bang. Each day, another Big Bang. And then followed by the, the playing out of these new natural laws. If you look at Genesis, the days, what's fascinating in terms of context, another big context is the genre context. And Hebrews had a special way of talking about things, and it was called Hebrew parallelism, where they would say something and then they'd, they'd repeat it. And um, the other thing that's going on in the days um, is the way that these days play into each other if you, if you stack them up side by side. So there's six creative days, right? The seventh, that is the day of rest. On the first day, so, so remember, what's, what's going on in verse 1? Some of you got this memorized. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And so what's being said in verse 1 is there's things that God didn't create. So God doesn't create chaos. God didn't create darkness. God didn't create, what was the other thing that said? There's three things. Oh, and empty. And it was, what is, what is, the, what is the actual verse? Uh, void. So void is empty, formless, formlessness. There's so chaos is formless, formless, darkness, and empty. Okay. So think about that. Now, what plays out? What plays out is day one gives us um, uh, light and dark, right? What does day two give us? The second day. He separates the light and darkness. Then um, the separation of the expanse, right? The expanse yeah, above. The waters, divide the waters from waters. So the expanse of the waters. Then what is about day three? What's going on in day three? Uh, Let the waters under the heavens. Oh, then land. Water. Then land and water, right? Land so this is like basically, yeah. So, so what you have, guys, if you look at this, it, except for uh, one particular detail, which is the showing up, I think, of the water creatures. You have basically containers. And then on the next three days, you've got the filling of the containers. So there's a deep parallelism between days one and three, day four and two, and day 
6 and day 3. Stars and moon and all the heavenly hosts fill the expanse. And then you have on day 4, what's going on? What's being made on day 4? You have the birds and the fish, isn't that right? So they're filling these this expanse of the sky and the water. And then you have the land animals and people. Isn't that neat? And so what that kind of just shows is that probably, again, looking at genre, it is utterly reasonable that the original here saw this poetically and saw that there was an answer. The, the creative order begins like this. In the beginning, God. So there's something that exists outside of creation. God creates. But what happens is he creates out of chaos and formlessness, out of darkness and out of emptiness. And into these things, he uh, gives form to what is formless, he gives light to what is dark, and he gives fill, filling to things that are empty. It's amazing. So he makes the boxes, and then he fills them. So I'm just saying that this is just another way we look at this instead of saying straight 24-hour days in some kind of a, a very a heavily literalistic sense. And, and um, again, we should have patience with each other because, like I said, serious Christians are in all these different camps. So we've got, I think we've knocked out some of this stuff. What about the knowledge? What was the knowledge that Adam and Eve gained from eating the tree of knowledge? Is it the desire for knowledge good? Would knowledge in the case of temptation have enabled Adam and Eve to resist more effectively? So let's let's just explore that, because I think that what we're getting to is really Rick, great. Yeah. Do all three camps uh, acknowledge that Adam and Eve are real people? or No. No. Which camp? So the theistic evolution camp would say that there is no historical Adam, that you basically have, again, the crawling upward motion of humanity, and there is no signal, signal moment when the sort of the light of the image of God descends on man. Both of these camps would probably deny that, and in part from a theological perspective. If, if and by the way, this is, this is a rip from the headlines, but you can't, your view of man here is really problematic. Because if you don't have that signal moment that separates man from the other higher primates from which he came, let's say God formed us from higher primates, if you don't have that signal original um, family, then what you have is just the story that we got from Darwin, which is that we're all just sort of crawling upward, and there's no reason to believe that different parts of the human race are at different stages of the evolutionary ladder. And everybody knows what comes out of that. Somebody tell me what racism. comes out of that. Racism. racism. Bad racism. And racism was baked into the cake at Darwin. Darwin is a, a, a raging atheist. He or atheist and racist. He was not a raging atheist. He was an agnostic. <laughs> he was a raging racist. Now, when I say rage, rage is the wrong word. He was just a, an overt racist. That's what I mean. I don't mean he was like angry. He was just, he, he absolutely believed the African races were at the bottom of the human food chain, that there is actually less distance biologically between an orangutan and uh, an aborigine from Australia than there was between the aborigine from Australia and the European man. And of course, that's not scientifically correct. We are the same species. Um, and we are the youngest species, which is wild to say that too. Um, but uh, some forms of Darwinian racism were just sort of baked into the cake, and it's really hard to get around it. When I say it's ripped from the headlines, I don't know if anybody's taken the time to read the manifesto of the guy who shot up the mall in Buffalo, but he got almost all his ideas from boop, boop. Darwin. So um, he believed the blacks were inferior. He kind of has that whole, then he just starts to tick the boxes of the science lectures that he was reading, nature, and he just extrapolated. Well, if we're all just sort of climbing up from the primordial swamp, then we're obviously all at different stages of evolution. And there's no, there's no good reason to believe that we're all part of the same family. Not after, and he actually says this in his manifesto, not after like thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of separation of the species, of the, of the races. Yeah. So this goes into what you were trying to say. Um, there is scientific proof that there is a mitochondrial Adam and mitochondrial Eve, that all the DNA of the current humans 
species come from? So my question to you is, is that um, like our fixed point, this mitochondrial even atom? The people who don't believe in our, our primordial, original human breeding pair don't accept that. They think that the mitochondrial DNA that we have from one human female uh, does not line up at the same time as the chromosomal atom. So every they every a couple. they weren't a couple, or they couldn't have been. Now some do. I'm just saying that that we, we those ages are just really yeah. elastic. So it used to be that chromosomal atom was like at a hundred thousand years, and now we think it might be forty thousand years ago, and that mitochondrial lead was maybe you know again far distant. So uh, William Lane Craig thinks that they are likely could have been a breeding pair. The chromosomal atom and mitochondria from which every human female and male derive their DNA could have been an original breeding pair. And that's the smoking gun. So, but I get, again, I say there's different uh, views of that. But, um, but Craig is, is adamant about it and believes that scientific <laughs> evidence backs it up that we could have all come from an original breeding pair. And that is not just about racism, but that's also about salvation. Like if we're part of a different human race, we're part of different problem, or different human races, then we have different problems. We we are no longer um, Adam's kin, and falling under Adam's curse, and therefore needing to be saved out of Adam's curse. And you know what what um, Richard Dawkins said is that Darwinism leaves uh, Jesus without a job, <laughs> because you know if there's no if there's no fall, if there's no image, then there's no fall. If there's no fall, there's no need to be saved. Yeah. Are we doing dinosaurs later? No. So let's do it right now. So um, dinosaurs for the young Earth creationists. We just watched Jurassic World last night. Nice. So for for young Earth creationists, dinosaurs fit in. Uh, in they would believe that they they all existed uh, contemporaneously with humans. And you say, well, what's the evidence of that? Around on a brontosaurus. Could have, but didn't likely. And so you say, well, what about the fact that they're in a different strata, right, of the of the geologic timetable? Well, the, a young Earth creationist puts a lot of emphasis on flood geology. So they believe that the universe was uh, that the universe that the Earth was flooded by water at the time of Noah, and literally that was universal. It water covered every continent, and that and that before that time, um, all the animals that are in the in the ground. All the fossils were all contemporaneous. They all lived together. The Ankylosaurus and the Stegosaurus and the T-Rex and the gotcha. gazelle and the saber-toothed tiger and, and grizzly bears, and they all lived together. And all those extinct ones just didn't get on the ark. No. Uh, yes, that, that would be a premise, that, that, the, that the largest uh, um, dinosaurs couldn't have been taken. But the other thing would be that... Um, uh, that then, that then what the flood did was laid down this geologic silt basically over a period of a year. And they would have just shrunk that like from basically 300 million years between the Cambrian explosion and us, and they would shrunk, they shrink that down to a year. So one, and every time there was a new layer of sediment that, that, that settled out after a universal deluge, that each one of those is just basically, and so, Animals <laughs> fell wherever they fell in this strata. T Rex wanted to get into the ark. <laughs> and he just, yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> he and, open so, the door. and so what they would say is, well, then, so you got why, why simple here and complex here? And they would say, well, because simple were dumb and couldn't get out of the way. And then if you were smarter and higher functioning, you could you could climb while flooding happened. And then you, you know, so that's the stratification of simple to complex. So that's their explanation. Um, and they point to some interesting things. Um, there, we found uh, soft tissue in a T-Rex bone. I don't know if you guys know this. They actually chopped the cheap T-Rex bone, which is 60 million years old, and, or 30 million, and they chopped it accidentally. <laughs> I think that, I, I can't remember the story. It's fascinating how an archaeologist uh, cut it open and realized that there was soft tissue inside it. <laughs> so that sent the geologic world buzzing and I don't think it's overturned anything but younger creationists just seized on that and they said there's just no way that that thing's 60 million years old it has still soft tissue in it but it's true there's soft tissue cartilage and they don't think they can get DNA out of it but it's cartilage 
and uh, they found now they also there's there's some like uh, um, trees that run that are petrified through five different layers of strata which are supposedly 50 million years across of difference and they would say well you see that's just sediment getting laid down over one lifetime not gajillions of lifetimes and then why well, there's a name for that too i can't remember what that is cross strata phenomena so there's all sorts of you know but i, I don't think that that's a strong position and i don't hold it but there it is um, so dinosaurs fit in contemporaneous with humans in this picture. And in both of these pictures, it's basically just accept the geological timetable as presented. And so they would say, how does that fit with Genesis? Well, simple, like that, that if these are epochs, then whatever got creative activity is going on in days one, two, three, four, and five is preceding the creation of people. And by the way, that fits perfect, right? People are last. And that's... <clears throat> That's true. People are last. They are, we are the youngest species on planet Earth. Do some of them believe like the fall happened during any of this time? These these people, if they're they're if they're orthodox, they they re, we're required to believe in some kind of fall because we have to believe that there was an original state of grace. But they would just believe that you could have seen like if you listen to C.S. Lewis, and he actually describes the creation in his book, The Problem of Pain, a brilliant chapter. You should read it. It basically takes the evolutionary account at face value. But then he imagines how God takes a higher primate and in some sense just selects one. If you can imagine, um, um, shoot, not the Planet of the Apes, the one with Obelix. The, the, yes, the 2001 A Space Odyssey. If you can imagine that, that's, that, that's almost what C.S. Lewis was imagining, how a higher primate was just basically plucked by God with a breeding a mate and was and his image just descended on them. Huh. And they had obviously gone through this what what Lewis describes as this evolutionary process that that through whatever selection mechanisms were were there, that you know, this this creature had a big enough brain for language function and a mouth artic for articulating speech and all the things. And then that person, that person was now a person, not an animal, and was utterly separate now, not just from the rest of the animal kingdom, but from the rest of his species. And by the way, they would say that that explains that very enigmatic moment in the creation narrative. You guys remember this in Genesis 2, where God says to Adam, hey, look at all these animals. Can you find a spouse? And what, you know, it's like, that's creepy and weird. Well, what if God has taken Adam up from animality? He's taken him up from a higher primate, and now in one sense, what he's not looking at is giraffes. He's looking at his own species and saying, I don't belong here. There's no one. And that's what Adam says to God. God, there's no one here for me because I'm, I'm now different. I'm different from anything else in the animal kingdom. And so God says, okay, and then you go to sleep, and he finds him a breeding, and he gets him a breeding mate, and away they go. So that would be a theistic evolutionary way of looking at the Genesis story through that lens. God has superintended the evolutionary process. A higher primate has showed up. God has selected out a breeding pair uh, to infuse his image into them. Creativity, language, uh, moral apprehension, uh, consciousness, all the things. And then from them, the human race is born. And now he sets up his overseers over the rest of creation. You could interpret that as creating them in his image by giving that consciousness, self-awareness, and those things. Yes. I, I would say that's how they would. What is the image? That's how they would yeah. say. Consciousness, moral apprehension, language. My actual appearance. No. Okay. And yes, thank you. Because that was one of the questions. No. Right? So when we say image of God, we do not mean that God has, you know. He has two arms. And two yeah. Arms. Two eyeballs in the middle of his face and the whole thing, right? Yeah. Which also supports the DNA evidence as well, like us being separate from... Like, yes, us being different. Now, we do have 97%... Being able to... Is it procreate? Procreate. Pro procreate with other species? Like, like the, the other... The other homo. Like those other, like, homo erectus or Neanderthal and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that what you mean? Just that, how, how separate we are. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> yes. Like there is a clean break. Now, we are 97% of our DNA is like the chimpanzee, but that 3% is really a wild big difference. And and we've, 
we've made too much of the fact that we are 97%. Like we're 60% of a mouse. So are we 60% mouse? Right? So there's so many things, livers, kidneys, you know, that we share with every mammalian species that the idea that we have a huge swath of our DNA that's similar to them for almost means nothing when it comes to spiritually. And yeah, so look at us. And we are utterly distinct from the animal kingdom. So, so yeah. So I think we've knocked out a bunch of things here, gang. And, um, but the, this whole picture of the, um, of the garden now is God taking this original human pair and, um, whether, you know, whether they represent sort of a breeding stock or, because by the way, those names mean man and mother, that's what Adam and Eve mean, but God takes them and, um, what was the knowledge that they gained from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, they gained the knowledge of good and evil. Right? So all they knew was uninterrupted fellowship with God, which was for their good. And in that sense, they were naive. They were like, like three-year-olds. And so they had no, they had no awareness of evil. So they gained the knowledge of good and evil. They gained the idea that, oh, evil is this thing of going against what God wants. They had no knowledge of that. And then the resulting shame. So they got to know all of it. They also got to know the death of it. So, so Satan didn't necessarily lie to them. He deceived them, but they did gain knowledge of God. Yeah, they did. What he lied about is that he said, you will not die. Right. Surely you won't die. Surely you will not die. He also told them that they would be like God. You'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Yeah. And again, a partial truth, right? Because God understood the difference between good and evil. Um, but uh, but for them, knowledge was, uh, this knowledge was their fall. And you say, so the question was, well, would knowledge uh, in the case of temptation have enabled Adam and Eve to resist more effectively? They had the knowledge that they needed, guys. So what they had was, what, what does that tree say? The tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, in the middle of paradise, says choice right here's a here's a tree of any tree of the garden i'm quoting him of any tree of the garden you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you must not eat that's knowledge and it's the knowledge of a command and what it required was faith faith in god. god they just had to trust that he was good and they had no reason not to believe that of any tree of the knowledge of good and evil here's the pristine earth i put you on it as overseers and stewards and everything you need is here in front of you. Trust me. Oh, now don't do this one thing. And then it was like, okay. And and Lewis, again, because he's not really trying to, you know, overturn Dar Darwinism, in his description of this creative thing, he says he he can imagine that that these humans went on in uninterrupted fellowship with God, maybe for eons. And they just were in pristine ignorance of evil. And then the day they fell. And he believes in a real fall inside an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. or was that, or Adam and Eve in the garden for like a, a while, or did they mess it up? Well, this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. Like, no, we don't know. There isn't any. The answer is we don't says, know. It's right? a really short. What's that? The, the Bible doesn't say how long that no. time is. No. So it's not long speculation. in the Bible, but yeah, it the, doesn't specify. In the, text, it's, in, in the text, it almost feels instant, but there's no description of it. I'd like to think it Yes, we'd like to think it was at least a week. But yeah, you know, like they, they just had a week to get it right. You know? I was convinced they did it right away, and like, I'm going right there. Yeah, and so and so we don't know. It goes at the end of chapter two is the is this soaring uh, passage of of their marriage, right? Uh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother, be united with his close. And the, and the man and woman are both naked and not ashamed. Boom. That's how we end chapter two. It's beautiful. It's done. Now, chapter three. Now, the snake was the most crafty of all the animals in the garden. So that, there's your gap. So I don't know. No one knows. And like you said, if we take the, that whole story to not necessarily be referring to A, a literal timeline, or B, a literal um, couple, then a, a theistic evolutionist would say 
And like, like Lewis could speculate, he could say, maybe they went on in uninterrupted fellowship with God for eons. And then fell. So there you go, yeah. And the man and woman was both naked and not ashamed. And then the very next chapter, now the serpent was more crafty than other beasts of the field. And isn't it interesting, why does the snake get cursed to live on its belly when that's what it always does? Right? So obviously, the original audience could have already seen there's a metaphorical aspect to this whole thing. And by the way, every Christian believes that that is a representation of Satan. So the symbolic reading of this is baked into the cake. There's no Christian who doesn't think that the serpent is actually a reference to spirit, a spiritual power of evil that is beyond an animal. But there's nothing in the text that says that. The text only talks about a, a snake. But in the rest of scripture, the serpent or the snake or the dragon represents the devil. And so we recognize that the tempter comes to them in the form of a serpent is actually the devil. Go ahead. So there's, there's a question. Yeah. Jack Scott, but it feels like it's later on about it's it's more theorizing to salvation. What does he say? Okay. He says We might push it, Jack, but um I just want to hear it first. Um so, uh, here's my question. So let's say a person sins and then asks for forgiveness, but the person continues to do the same sin over and over and over. When does God say that's enough? When is it enough? Does God keep forgiving and continuing sin? Does God keep forgiving, continuing sinning over and over? And if God continues to keep forgiving the ongoing sin, that would mean that would mean hell is pretty empty place. I can't think of any other way to ask this. Okay, no, that's a great question. Thank you, Jack. We will deal with it next week. Let's do that, though. That's what I'm saying. It's like, no. Yep. No, let's let's absolutely uh, get copy and paste it and shoot that to me. Got it. All right, so seven, why did God bother to make the earth uh, and create humans? Couldn't God have just made us perfect in heaven and skipped the whole sin, subsequent need for salvation, all that stuff? Is our time on earth a probationary period? And if so, doesn't God already know the outcome of this negating the point? This whole thing gets to the problem of evil and, and God's omniscience. You know, if he knows everything, what, what what's the point of this? And um, so... I, I talked about this with the youth on um, last Thursday, and basically it has a very simple answer, and the answer is love. So now let's explain that. Why would God go through this process? The answer is love. You can't have love without freedom. And that's a fact. Now think about that for a second. Think, is that true? Can you not have love without freedom? Could God have made us incapable of sin and yet still able to love? Because if you're incapable of sin, they're not free. You, you don't have another choice. But clearly Adam and Eve had a choice. That was the whole point, right? Here I put you in this garden, and you have a choice. And it's almost like it's implied, it's almost explicit. Hi, I'm, I'm conducting a great big freedom experiment. Welcome to my freedom experiment. I'm going to give you everything you ever needed, but you have a choice. You have one choice. You can just say, screw you, and not trust me. And, and go ahead. What will your choice be? It's almost like freedom is just baked in the cake. Now you say, why would God do that? And the answer is because of love. I could go home right now and remember the old days when our screensavers, like you could put text, and then the <laughs> screensaver would just show whatever text you put on there, you know? Like sometimes you change it for your honey and you say, I love you, John, or whatever like that, all right? So you put that on there, and uh, someone would come home to a wonderful message. Now what if I put on my own computer, I love you, Rick. And then I just walked home and I saw my computer that my screensaver had showed, you know, that engaged. And there was just bringing me this beautiful message of love. How much love do I feel from this computer with that screensaver on? Answer? None. Zero. Why? I put it in there. I programmed that in there. And does it have a choice? Can it say, I hate you, Rick, you're a dumb, <laughs> dumb slob and Canadians are stupid? <laughs> it doesn't even have a choice. It can't do that. It can only say the thing I told it to say, which is, I love you, Rick, you're the best. It's from your soul. Right. So in the same way, if God programs us, if he doesn't give us a choice, it's like he's programmed us, right? Because he's given us one script. And the script is, I love you, God. <clears throat> And I guess that's it, because that's all I get. No, God puts us in a real and risky world, and that's why he goes through the process of creation. 
And it is a probation. It does set up creation then as this probationary thing. And, and what's wild about that is that it looks like the point was probation. Because there's another tree. Does anybody know what the tree, the other tree is? The tree of life. There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's a tree of life. And after they've sinned, what happens? Does anyone know? They're barred from eating the tree of life. So it looks to all the world that the freedom experiment was set up as a probationary period, and then they would eat the tree of life, and they would live forever. And who knows what that would mean? Maybe we would, you know, be taken out of this created order, or we would be forever sort of enshrined as the, um, you know, uh, the unconquerable, indomitable stewards of this created order and unable to die. But in other words, our, 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 our immortality was conditional upon our obedience. And having not obeyed, we sank back into our, our mortality, and that's the curse. And so now, when is when does the tree of life show up again? Does anyone know? It shows up again in the Bible. Revelation. Revelation, last chapter. When God re recreates the entire thing, he claims earth again. In other words, he's not done with earth even though it fell, and we brought creation down with us as stewards That's that, that we had that capacity. Does that help that with that question? Any follow-up on that? With the... The Garden of Eden, so we were, Adam and Eve were sent out of the Garden of Eden. So did he destroy the garden? Did the garden, what happened to the garden? We don't know. Uh, the only thing the Bible says is that it was barred, barred access. Guarded by a couple of angels. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we don't know. Tussles. Some people are trying to locate it. Yeah. Because it looks to all the world that the Eden has a physical location. And four, four, it's surrounded by four rivers. Two of them are known mm -hmm. and named. Well, they're all named. Two are known. So the one is um, Euphrates and Tigris, and the two are un, Gihon, un, Gihon, the right? Gihon and the um, Ophir, I think. No, not Ophir. Um, yeah. Havilah. Havilah. I know this because my cousin named his daughter Havilah. And I said when she named her, I said, there is gold there, because that's what the Bible says. <laughs> Have a look. There is gold there. Okay, it's 8 o'clock. Let's call that a wrap for today. And I said we were going to move faster. We did not. I lied to you totally. I totally lied to you. But isn't this interesting stuff? And we can see how we can harmonize science and faith. Let's end on this idea, this big thought. The idea that Christianity is opposed to science stands refuted on the bald, unalterable historical fact that the discipline of science was first purported and invented by people of deep faith who are Christians. You just take that to the bank. Mom! 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 Mom. Mommy! Everyone got that? Who are the great scientists that you know, the originators of the disciplines? Name the originals. Kepler, Newton, Galileo, keep going, Bacon, Newton, Copernicus, name them, all Christians, all Christians. So the idea that Christianity is somehow hostile to the idea of looking into the natural world and testing hypotheses and seeing how it works and discovering natural laws, this is our game, our game, Christians, this is our game. We invented this game and gave it to the world. And then it was taken over, in some sense, by the atheists. And why? Because it was so successful. Because the earth and the creator is so uniform. It's just driven by law. And it was so regular that you didn't have to believe in God for it to work. And then it became your God because it's like, man alive, I can do this experiment. And every day the sun gets up at the same time and I can know the speed of light and I can know how cells multiply and I can know how bacteria, you know, and I don't have to believe in God for any of that stuff. But here's the question. If you were an atheist based on atheistic principles, would you have ever invented the discipline? And no one ever thinks about that. Now, we can never go back. We can't rewind the tape. We can't invent science again. It's done. We gave it to the world. The question is, would atheists have ever invented it? And I think the answer is no. Why not? 
Because if you don't believe in an inherent designer, you do have no reason to believe that the created order is regular, that it, that it would obey laws, that it would be lawful, that it would have rules. Why not? Well, it's chaos. It's all random. It's all random and chaos. And by the way, the, the world before uh, the biblical world sort of took over, believe that. It believed that the universe was run by chaos. In fact, the ocean was a big fat metaphor for nature. And nature was like the ocean, the deep waters. By the way, that's why they show up in Genesis chapter 1. They represent chaos. Because the natural world to all pagan societies was chaos. It was There was no order to it. There was no design to it. It was haphazard. It, it didn't follow a pattern. And so because it didn't, it was like, you know, magic. That's what we did. That's why we did magic, because magic was a way of trying to harness nature to try and manipulate it to try to. Magic and science almost actually come from the same place, a desire to you know, harness nature. One worked and one doesn't. So anyway, let's just leave it at that. Um, the reason why Christians have a unique problem with their origin story is because the, the secular origin myth has been used to kick God out of the culture. And Christians have blocked at that. They said, no. They said, I, we have a problem with your origin story. Well, and then they, they will then appeal to young earth creationism, which, by the way, just utterly puts a particular interpretation of Genesis over any scientific discovery. And that is where they get into problems with the appearances of age and the appearances of all that kind of stuff. But... Um, but their their religious impulse comes from a defensive stance that says, I don't care, about, I, I love science, science is awesome. There are young earth creationists that are utterly well credentialed, super smart. A guy named Sarfati is a guy who can, who can blindfold conduct and win 10 chess matches. He's like super smart and he's a young earth creationist. So it's not like he doesn't know facts. He doesn't like he doesn't know the, the, the geological timetable. It's not like he has a red Darwin, right? But he just believes that a literal <laughs> rendering of Genesis 1 trumps everything. And so um, our issue then with origins is really more of a religious one than a scientific one. And I think if you're in this camp, you just follow the evidence where it leads. You don't care. So you just follow the evidence where it leads. Is it an old earth? Okay. That fits. And um, uh, was were, were natural processes responsible for this thing here? Yeah, okay. Sounds, this is fine. Let the earth bring forth. You know, God has endowed creation with certain powers. Now, unlimited powers, because if you're a Darwinian, you have to believe unlimited power. That 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 natural selection and um, variation in natural selection are capable of doing just miraculous wonders. And is that even possible? And I think the answer to that uh, is young earth is, one's is interesting no. though about the. Yeah, the, uh, the appearance of age because we've just like like doing airplane stuff like we've discovered with alloys like making them old like, mm. we, we create new alloys now mm -hmm. but aging them actually makes them stronger oh wow so we we we, we you created a way speed age them we, we make them old on purpose that, you know, and again, you know, young earth creationists have clocks that they appeal to that tell you that the universe is young, like the rocks that have come out of Mount St. Helens. If you age them, all that all that pumice that turned into now the tabletop moon landing, the, the lunar landscape that is Mount St. Helens, it all reads five million years old. And we all know that it's, what, 1980? Yeah, 19. It's not that old. So sometimes the, the clocks that we use for radiometric dating and stuff are not, you know, infallible, so I, Okay, right, let's end with a word of prayer. Father, again, we, are, we thank you for these minds that you've given us, that they flow from your mind. And that when we look into the natural world, we are in some sense reading you. We are thinking your thoughts after you did. It's amazing. And that's what Kepler said. So we stand with that, brother, on the beauty and the truth and the goodness of the natural world and how it reveals you. And we pray that we would, you would reveal it yourself to us more and more as we seek. Amen. Amen. Amen.